At the ripe age of 71, you'd reckon I'd settled into a quiet life, what with George constantly off rubbing elbows with the bigwigs and me, Margaret, keeping the home fires burning. Our nest, a tidy spread in a leafy suburb, was just the two of us now, save for the occasional flutter when our son, Michael, his wife, Laura, and our darling granddaughter, Emily, flew in from the city. George's gig with the governor meant he was more often out than in, leaving me to my devices, which lately meant more charity drives than I could count on both hands. Proud? You bet. Lonely? Sometimes, but you don't get to my age without learning a trick or two about keeping busy. Then came the curveball. Michael rang one evening, the excitement in his voice so thick you could slice it. Mom, Dad, we're doing it. We're buying a farm. Can you believe it? A farm? I echoed, my voice flat. This was news, all right. News that had me wondering if city life had finally addled their brains. Yeah, it's happening. We're moving out there, starting fresh. It's going to be great for Emily, Michael explained, his words tumbling out faster than I could catch them. George, ever the rock, just nodded along, throwing an A. That's quite the leap, son. But if you're sure, we've got your back. I kept my peace, biting my tongue hard enough to taste blood. A farm, of all things. But what was said was said. We helped them with the deposit, not without a hefty dose of skepticism on my part. Since they'd moved, my phone's been buzzing non-stop with updates. Pictures of chickens, endless fields, and Emily, always Emily, grinning ear to ear, her cheeks pink with country air. Laura sends snapshots of their latest harvest, her texts bubbling with pride. Look at what we've grown, Margaret. Can't wait for you to see it all. And George, bless him, laps it up, showing off the photos at his fancy dinners, bragging about our little farmers, to anyone within earshot. Me? I'm more grounded. That's all well and good, I'd say. But photos, don't plow the fields. I hadn't set foot on their farm yet. Between the charity events and keeping our own home from falling into disarray, there just hadn't been time. But that didn't stop the nightly calls. Mom, you should see the place now. It's incredible. Michael would start, his voice a mix of exhaustion and exhilaration. I'm sure it is. I'd reply, keeping it short, not wanting to dampen his spirit with my reservations. George, catching me after one such call, laid it out plain. Margaret, we should visit. See it for ourselves. It's important to Michael. I sighed, the weight of his words settling on my shoulders. All right, but I'm not sugarcoating my thoughts. If they're in over their heads, they need to hear it. Fair enough. George agreed, his hand finding mine, a silent promise of solidarity. So, we marked the calendar, a visit to the farm looming over us like a storm cloud. I couldn't shake the feeling that what awaited us was more than just fresh produce and country air. One afternoon, I started feeling a bit off. Nothing specific, just not my usual self. George noticed right away. Margaret, you're looking a bit pale. Maybe we should get you checked out, he said, his brow furrowed with worry. I brushed off his concern with a wave of my hand. It's probably just the change in weather. I'll be fine. But George wouldn't have any of it. The next thing I knew, we were sitting in the doctor's office, waiting for some answers. The doctor, a young man with a reassuring smile, told us it wasn't anything serious, but I needed to avoid being alone for long stretches and should spend more time outdoors. Fresh air and company will do you good, he advised. The timing couldn't have been worse. George was due to leave on one of his lengthy business trips. He looked at me, his mind racing for solutions. What about staying with Michael and Laura on the farm? It's peaceful, and you won't be alone. The farm. Just the thought of it made me uneasy, though I couldn't pinpoint why. I'm not sure that's a good idea, I muttered, more to myself than to George. But George, ever the problem solver, was persistent. It's perfect. Fresh air, family, and you won't be by yourself. I'll talk to Michael. 
I had a long heart-to-heart -heart with Michael over the phone. It wasn't easy. Mom, are you sure about this? We'd love to have you, but we know how much you value your space and routine, he said, sounding hesitant. It's not my first choice, Michael, but your father thinks it's a good idea. And the doctor did say I should be around family and outdoors more, I replied, trying to sound more convinced than I felt. Laura chimed in, her voice, bright but cautious. We can make it work, Margaret. It'll be nice having you with us. Emily will be thrilled. Their willingness to have me over tipped the scales. Despite my reservations, I agreed. All right, I'll give it a try. But let's make one thing clear, I'm not there to be waited on hand and foot. I'll help out where I can. Packing my bags felt strange, like I was heading off to an uncertain adventure rather than my son's home. George drove me to the farm, trying to keep the mood light. You'll see, it'll be good for you. And before you know it, I'll be back, and we'll laugh about how worried we were. The farm was buzzing with life the day I arrived, but nobody was more excited to see me than my little granddaughter, Emily. She was all smiles and hugs, her energy infectious. We spent our days roaming the fields, reading stories under the shade of an old oak tree, and playing games that left us both laughing until our sides hurt. Emily clung to me like a shadow, her affection, clear as day. It was a grandmother's dream come true, but not everyone was basking in the warmth of our bond. Laura, my daughter-in-law, wasn't too pleased with how things were turning out. It was like a cloud had settled over the house, and you could cut the tension with a knife. Every time Emily chose to spend time with me over helping her mom with chores, Laura's frown deepened, her displeasure barely concealed. Feeling the strain, I figured I'd lend a hand around the house, hoping to ease some of the tension. Laura, let me help you with dinner tonight. I offered one afternoon, trying to bridge the gap between us. Laura looked at me, her expression a mix of surprise and something else I couldn't quite place. Sure, if you think you can handle it. Just don't mess up my kitchen, she replied, her tone laced with a hint of sarcasm. I brushed off her comment and got to work, doing my best to prepare a meal that would bring some semblance of peace to the household. I even took to tidying up around the house, hoping my efforts would lighten her load and, in turn, her mood. But it seemed my attempts were met with more mockery than appreciation. Wow, look at you, playing the domestic goddess. What's next, gonna take over the farm chores too? Laura joked one evening as I set the table, her laughter not quite reaching her eyes. I forced a smile, choosing to keep the peace. Just trying to help out where I can, Laura. No need for any jabs. Her smile faltered, and for a moment, I thought I saw a flicker of guilt. Yeah, well, just don't overdo it. Wouldn't want you wearing yourself out, she said, her voice with a coolness that left me feeling more like an outsider than part of the family. Despite the chill in the air, Emily remained my sunshine, her love unwavering. But it was clear that my presence had stirred up more than just familial joy. The dynamics in the house had shifted, and I found myself treading a fine line between helping out and stepping on toes. It was a delicate dance, one I wasn't sure I knew the steps to. As the days passed, the balance I sought remained elusive, the warmth of my granddaughter's love overshadowed by the growing coldness from Laura. It was a situation I had hoped to avoid, but there I was, caught in the middle of familial love and rivalry, wondering if my attempt to smooth things over was doing more harm than good. The afternoon sun cast long shadows across the farm as I sat quietly on the porch, lost in thought. My days here, initially filled with the simple joys of spending time with Emily, had taken an unexpected turn. Laura approached, her footsteps firm and purposeful. I braced myself for what I sensed was more than a casual conversation. Margaret, we need to talk. Laura began, her tone firm, leaving no room for the usual pleasantries. She took a seat opposite me, her posture rigid. Of course, Laura. What's on your mind? I asked, trying to keep my voice even, despite the tension. It's about the work around here, and your contribution, she said, her eyes not quite meeting mine. You've been great with Emily, and we appreciate that, 
but there's a lot more to be done. This isn't a holiday. We're running a farm here. I felt a pang of hurt. I understand that, Laura. I've been trying to help out as much as I can. You know I haven't been feeling well, I replied, my voice tinged with a mix of frustration and disappointment. Laura's response was swift and sharp. Feeling unwell? We all have our burdens, Margaret. But we still need to do our part. It's not fair to the rest of us if you're not contributing. Her words stung, and I struggled to find a response. Before I could gather my thoughts, Michael joined us, his expression serious. Mom, Laura's right. We're all stretched thin as it is. We were hoping you'd understand the situation and help out more, Michael added, siding with Laura. I looked from Laura to Michael, feeling a deep sense of betrayal. I thought I was helping by taking care of Emily and assisting where I could. I didn't realize my efforts were seen as insufficient. I said, my voice, barely above a whisper. The conversation took an even more disheartening turn when Laura mentioned money. Look, Margaret, the reality is that hosting an extra person costs money. We hadn't planned for this, and frankly, we need you to contribute financially for your stay here. I was dumbfounded. Contribute financially? I came here to be with family, not to be charged for my visit. I don't have any money with me. George handles our finances, I explained, feeling a mix of anger and disbelief. Michael chimed in, his tone apologetic yet firm. We're not trying to be harsh, Mom, but the farm isn't doing as well as we'd hoped. We're just asking for a little help to cover the extra expenses. It's only fair. The word fair echoed in my mind. Fair? Was it fair to ask me, still not fully recovered and invited as family, to pay for my presence? Seeing my hesitation, Laura offered a cold compromise. If money is an issue, there are plenty of chores that need doing. You can earn your keep that way. It's only fair, considering. The conversation left me reeling. My son and daughter-in-law's demands felt like a slap in the face, a harsh reminder that my place in this family was not as secure as I had thought. After Laura laid her demands on me, I stood there, feeling a mix of disbelief and anger boiling inside. I can't believe what I'm hearing, I said, my voice trembling not just from age, but from pure outrage. I came here to be with family, not to be extorted. I'm leaving, first thing tomorrow. Laura's reaction was swift and cold, her laugh sharp enough to cut through the tense air. Leaving, are you? And let the whole world know how the governor's right-hand man's family is falling apart. How his wife can't even stand to be with her own son and granddaughter. That should make for a juicy story, don't you think? Her words hit me like a slap. This wasn't just a disagreement, it was outright blackmail. You wouldn't dare, I gasped, the threat hanging heavy between us. Oh, but I would. Think about it, Margaret. Your precious reputation and George's, all dragged through the mud. Is that what you want? Laura's eyes were alight with a dangerous mix of determination and anger. I turned to Michael, desperately hoping for some semblance of support, but his stance was clear. Mom, you know how hard things have been for us. We just need a bit more help, that's all. Laura's right, we can't afford any scandals. I was stunned. My own son, my flesh and blood, siding with this, this blackmail. So, you're okay with this? Threatening your own mother? I asked, my voice barely a whisper, laden with a mix of heartache and disbelief. Michael looked away, his discomfort evident, but his resolve unwavering. It's not like that, Mom. But we have to think about what's best for the family. And right now, we need to stick together. That means doing what's necessary. The realization hit me hard. My own family was willing to use me, to threaten me, to keep me in line. The love and warmth I thought bound us were conditional, easily overshadowed by fear and desperation. That night, as I lay in a bed that felt more like a prison than a haven, my mind raced. The threat to George's reputation, the betrayal by my own son, it was all too much. But leaving now would only give Laura what she wanted, ammunition to use against us. 
By morning, my resolve had hardened. I wouldn't let Laura's threats dictate my actions, but neither could I abandon my family, no matter how twisted the situation had become. I'll stay, I declared over breakfast, my voice firm. But not because of your threats, Laura. Because this family, however broken, is still my family. Laura smirked said it all, she thought she had won. But for me, this wasn't about winning or losing anymore. It was about protecting what little was left of our family's dignity, even if it meant enduring more of this bitter situation. The days that followed were some of the hardest of my life. I threw myself into the farm work, not just to prove Laura wrong, but to find some semblance of peace in the physical labor. It was a way to distance myself from the emotional turmoil, to turn my back on the blackmail and bitterness that had tainted my relationship with my son and his wife. But with every passing day, a part of me mourned the loss of what I had once believed my family to be. The realization that love and respect could be so easily overshadowed by desperation and greed was a bitter pill to swallow. And as I worked alongside those who had threatened and betrayed me, I couldn't help but wonder if the bonds of family could ever truly be mended. After Laura realized her threats had me cornered, she didn't hold back anymore. It was like living with a drill sergeant. Margaret, the kitchen won't clean itself, and those clothes won't wash themselves either. She'd bark orders as if I were a new recruit rather than family. Days turned into a cycle of endless chores. My only respite was time spent with Emily, my granddaughter, whose innocence and love were like a beacon of light in a steadily darkening world. But even those moments were fleeting, overshadowed by Laura's relentless demands. Gone were the days of self-care and leisurely shopping trips. My reflection became a stranger, one who looked worn and much older than her years. Fatigue became my constant companion, dragging me down further each day. One evening, mustering the little energy I had left, I tried to reason with Michael. I can't keep up with this pace. It's too much. I'm not well, I pleaded, hoping for a sliver of understanding. But empathy was in short supply. Mom, we're all tired. Laura's just making sure we keep the house running. Try to see it from our side, Michael's response was dismissive, his patience thin. My health continued to spiral. Eating became a chore, and every step was a battle. Laura's realization that her free labor was now incapable of even the most basic tasks finally prompted action, but not out of concern. Fear of accountability for their treatment of me led them to rush me to the clinic when I could barely stand. The doctor's assessment was grim, but not surprising. She needs to be admitted immediately. Her condition is serious, he announced after a thorough examination. Laura's reaction was telling. Admitted? But we need her at home. Can't she just get some medicine and rest there? Her concern wasn't for my well-being, but for the loss of a helping hand. Michael, finally sensing the gravity of the situation, interjected. Laura, this is serious. Mom's health comes first. As I lay in the hospital bed, the weight of my situation sank in. Removed from the farm's oppressive atmosphere, I realized how much I had endured and at what cost. Laura's dissatisfaction with my hospitalization, Michael's belated defense, and my own battered health painted a clear picture of how far things had gone awry. In that hospital room, decisions were made. I couldn't return to the farm, not after everything. It was a moment of clarity bought at a high price, a realization that sometimes, the cost of staying is far greater than the price of walking away. George walked into the hospital room, his face a mix of concern and shock. What happened to you? he asked, barely recognizing the frail figure before him. I tried to muster a smile, but it was hard. It's been tough, George. The farm, it wasn't what we thought. George turned to Michael, his voice hard. Explain. Now. Michael shuffled his feet, looking anywhere but at his father. Dad, we, we were struggling. The farm's a mess. We thought mom could help, but we didn't force her, I swear. George's gaze then fell on Laura, who had been standing quietly by the door, her daughter in tow. The look in his eyes was enough to send her scurrying out of the room, murmuring something about needing to check on something. 
Turning back to Michael, George's anger was palpable. Not force her? She's in the hospital, Michael. And I hear you've been asking her for money on top of everything? Michael's voice trembled. Dad, we just thought since mom was staying with us, she could help out a bit more, financially. George cut him off. Help out? I've been sending money to cover her expenses, and then some. Over $5,000, Michael. Where did that money go? I was stunned. You did? George, I had no idea. George's face softened as he looked at me. Of course, I did. I wanted to make sure you were taken care of. He then faced Michael again, his decision clear. I'm cutting off the financial support. And I want a refund for the money I sent. This, this was a mistake. Michael looked like he wanted to argue, but one look at his father's face, and he knew it was futile. I, understand, Dad. George turned back to me, taking my hands gently in his. I'm so sorry, love. This was my idea, thinking it would be good for you. I didn't know it would turn out like this. I could see the pain in his eyes, the guilt he felt for putting me in this situation. It's not your fault, George. You couldn't have known. He leaned down, kissing my hands, a gesture of love and apology. We'll get you out of here soon. Back home, where you belong. His words, his actions, they meant the world to me. Despite everything, George's love was unwavering. I love you, George. We'll get through this. Together. As George and I talked about the future, about going home and leaving the farm behind, I realized that this ordeal had brought us even closer. The hardship had been a test, one that we were passing together. My heart was full, knowing that no matter what, George stood by me, just as I would always stand by him. Recovery was neither swift nor easy, but day by day, I felt my strength returning. The ordeal at the farm, with its trials and tribulations, gradually receded into the background, becoming a distant, albeit painful, memory. Home never felt so welcoming, its familiar walls a sanctuary from the storm I had weathered. It was during one of these quiet mornings, the sunlight streaming through the window, that Michael came to visit. The tension between us was palpable, a silent testament to the rift that had formed. Mom, I… I don't even know where to start. Michael began, breaking the silence, with a voice heavy with remorse. Start with the truth, Michael. It's a good place as any. I replied, setting my cup down, bracing myself for what was to come. He sighed, a deep, soulful sound that spoke volumes. The farm, it's gone. We sold it, but even that wasn't enough to cover the debts. And Laura, she left. Said she couldn't handle it, the poverty, the struggles. She left Emily and me. The news of the farm didn't surprise me, but Laura's departure did. Despite everything, I hadn't expected her to abandon her family. And Emily? I asked, my heart aching for my granddaughter. She's with me. I got a job, a good one, at a trading company. We're getting by, Mom. It's not easy, but we're managing. He explained, and for the first time in a long while, I saw the old Michael in him. Michael, I won't pretend to understand all your choices, but know this, Emily will always have a home with me. And you, we have a lot to work through. Now I can't forgive you, I said. He nodded, relief and gratitude mingling in his expression. Thank you, Mom. That means, more than you know. One day, out of the blue, Laura called. I need money to come and see Emily. You can spare some, can't you? Her voice, once so commanding, now carried a hint of desperation. The audacity of her request took me aback. You think you can just walk back into her life after abandoning her? No, Laura. Emily doesn't need a mother like you. That was the last I heard from her. As for me, life has settled into a comfortable pace. My days are filled with little joys and the company of those I love. Emily's visits are the highlight of my weeks, her laughter a constant reminder of the resilience of the human spirit. Despite the trials, I've found contentment. The path wasn't easy, 
and the scars remain, but looking at Emily, I'm reminded of the hope that tomorrow holds. Forgiveness for Michael is a bridge yet to be crossed, but with time, perhaps we'll get there. For now, I cherish the peace and satisfaction of a life rebuilt, a testament to the enduring strength we possess within.